So for this lecture, I'm going high-tech, uh, distributing a few pages. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is uh, typically as far as I go in my, in my classes at uh, the University of ne Nevada, Las Vegas. Also, uh, I've never used any, anything more high-tech than, <coughs> than this. Um, Again, let me um, make a, a few a few personal remarks. Uh, one is, uh, since uh, some of you have seen uh, the videotape of uh, Mary Rothbards, I uh, should mention that for the last 10 years of his life, I was uh, his closest colleague. Um, in a way, I was his intellectual bodyguard. Um, I, I came to the United States in 1985 um, and worked with Murray uh, for a year in New York City. And when he was out of town, then I taught his classes. And then in 1986, <coughs> he received an offer for an endowed chair at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, which was the first big position that he ever held. Um, and uh, at that time, there was another opening. Um, and he asked me to come with him. And um, by accident, I got that job too. It was, I think, the only year uh, at that university where it was possible, but that both of us uh, could be hired. From that moment on, the composition of the department had changed in such a way that we never again would have received the job. Um, and then I stayed there until he died in 1995. And uh, now I'm the only lonely hold out there um, that they can no longer get rid of. Um, the, the other. Uh, the other remark uh, concerns uh, the lectures. Um, this is uh, the structure of the lectures um, is supposed to be the structure of my my next book project that I have. Um, so because of that, in a way, um, I put more work into it. Uh, than you normally tend to do. And on top of it, uh, it is uh, Lou Rockwell uh, who, by inviting me, always forces me to overcome my natural laziness and, uh, and put all my energy together and then prepare myself for these, uh, for these occasions. Um, in this lecture, I, I want to talk uh, about the spread of humans around the world and the extension and uh, the intensification of the division of labor. Um, this will continue a little bit into, uh, or this subject will be continued to a certain extent uh, in, in, the <coughs> next, in the next lecture, which I will um, give tomorrow morning. Um, uh, Homo sapiens, men as we, as we know it, uh, was about the cranial volume that, that we have, um, is estimated to be about 500,000 years old and um, uh, has, takes on the current appearance uh, roughly about uh, 100,000 years ago. Um, and uh, as I mentioned in the previous, previous lecture, um, <coughs> the, the point when uh, the language capability developed is dated somehow from uh, 150,000 uh, to 50,000 years ago. Um, there is general agreement, not complete agreement, but uh, 
pretty much unanimous agreement that um, um, that mankind um, spread out from Africa and uh, if you take a look at this um, first chart here which is taken from the Cavalli Sforza book um, he gives you some uh, rough dates about this process um, so uh, his estimation is that um, uh, people began to leave Africa 60 to 70,000 years ago, maybe up to 100,000 years ago, and uh, <coughs> that the first spreading um, was uh, to Asia. Um, we have the oldest uh, findings of uh, human uh, uh, skeletons and so forth in China dated at 67,000 years um, old and um, and then from uh, from China um, they they travel to uh, to Australia which he dates roughly at 55,000 years ago and this travel time, I'll have more to say about that, this travel time um, took about uh, 10,000 uh, 10, years from Africa to uh, Australia. Um, one will have to say here something about the possibilities of this traveling. Um, you have to keep in mind there existed a few glacial uh, glacial periods, actually four glacial periods in the last 900,000 years, and each of those lasted about 75,000 years. And the last one of these glacial periods uh, lasted from 25,000 years ago to about uh, 13,000. Uh, years ago and during these glacial periods of course uh, the level of the oceans uh, dropped considerably because uh, snow accumulated uh, on the mountains uh, and less water melted so that uh, the uh, the gaps between um, Southeast Asia and then um, uh, what is now Indonesia and Borneo and uh, Australia became rather small. They did not disappear completely, uh, but they were small enough that they could be traversed by uh, by very small, uh, very small boats. Um, the Sahara Sahara Desert, for instance, um, is only. Uh, 3,000 uh, 3, years old uh, before that that was uh, um, uh, uh, not exactly the most fruitful fruitful of areas but nonetheless uh, a region uh, that could be used for uh, hunting and gathering activities uh, and also for um, for agricultural uh, purposes. Um, the next uh, break off of, of the population is then the, the break off to, um, to Europe, uh, which uh, Cavalli's Forza dates around 40,000, 43,000 um, years ago. And, um, and the latest uh, split off is the one to America across the Bering Street, um, for which again very rough estimates only exist. Um, they range from 15,000 years ago to 50,000 um, years ago. And the spreading uh, 
of the population uh, on the uh, American continent um, is estimated to have lasted about a thousand years from the north all the way down to uh, Patagonia, which would be uh, something like eight, eight miles per year, so not a huge amount per year. Um, the spreading at this time is uh, either by foot um, or, and that was significantly faster, um, by boat. Um, boat travel remained the fastest way of, of traveling until uh, the uh, domestication of, uh, of horses, uh, which occurs only um, some 6,000 um, 6, years, years ago. Uh, until that time, as I said, uh, nothing but walking was possible. And uh, as a matter of fact, as you probably know from your history lessons, um, that was pretty much the only way of transportation that existed on the American continent until the arrival of Europeans. Uh, we always just picture these Indians on horses, but of course there existed no horses whatsoever. Um, and um, there existed actually on the American continent not even wheels. Um, that is to say people uh, transported things by, by, by schlepping some, uh, some wooden planks behind them on which they had uh, whatever they had to, uh, whatever they had to transport. Um, uh, during these uh, early times until about uh, 12 to 10,000 years ago, um, uh, all of these populations, all of these people uh, were hunters and uh, gatherers um, uh, moving uh, in small speeds uh, around, um, uh, mostly in small bands of uh, 50, 60 people. Um, but uh, several bands usually had some sort of uh, connection. Um, there exists some biological reason um, that minimal group sizes have to be about uh, 500 people in order to uh, prevent some sort of uh, genetic degeneration. So one can expect that um, even if they were in small bands, there was some sort of communication and intermarriage and so forth um, in, uh, with people of, uh, uh, of this um, group size. Um, the, the density of population was, as you can imagine, of course, uh, extremely low. Again, the estimation is there um, that in hunter-gatherer societies, uh, you can have only one person per, uh, per square mile. Uh, for, more, uh, for, uh, for a larger population, uh, the, uh, the earth did not uh, produce enough uh, food stuff, so to speak, uh, to, to support them. Um, population growth was uh, extremely, uh, extremely low, um, partly uh, because of um, uh, birth control techniques used by, um, by people by long breastfeeding and uh, things, uh, things of that nature, uh, and of course because of high, uh, high mortality rates. Um, we the estimation is that 100,000 years ago, so to speak, at the beginning of this process that I'm talking about, um, 
the population size was about 50,000 um, on the world, 50,000 on the entire globe. And um, uh, 10,000 years ago, that is the period that I will talk about a little bit later, uh, the so-called Neolithic Revolution, when people begin to settle down and uh, um, uh, begin agricultural existence, um, the numbers there are between 1 and 15 million, and the estimation that most people accept is about 5 million. So uh, from 100,000 years ago to um, to 10,000 years ago, 90,000 years of time, um, the population increases only from 50,000 uh, to 5 million. And that is roughly uh, a doubling of the population uh, every 13, 14,000 uh, years. Um, again, to give you some sort of ballpark figure, what uh, what the speed of doubling populations is uh, is now um, in, from the 1950s on um, uh, the populations doubled every every 35 years um, so you can see based on this figure uh, what extremely small growth of um, um, of population took place during this uh, period. Um, the groups basically simply broke away f from each other as soon as there was not enough foodstuff available and then uh, expanded to, uh, to different areas and uh, further and further along, as I said many times by boat, uh, uh, frequently also um, by foot, um, and there existed uh, then for uh, considerable amount of times, 90,000 years or so, um, uh, very little uh, communication and intermingling of these breakaway groups, um, which explains, so to speak, uh, the fact that uh, quite, um, quite different genetic stocks of people develop because very limited inbreeding uh, took place. In addition, take into consideration these glacial periods which uh, cut off sometimes for ten thousands of years communication between groups that were not distance-wise far apart from each other. Um, uh, the Alps, for instance, became uh, essentially impassable. Uh, so people who were in the n north uh, lost all the contact with people who were in the south. Uh, the weather, c r r the rains in, in uh, Eurasia come uh, mostly from, um, uh, from the west and uh, eastward, uh, so most of the snow accumulated in, in the west and the drier climates were in the east, so then people moved from, uh, uh, from the west to the east and then partially uh, after the glacial periods were over, then uh, returned back to more western, uh, uh, western regions. Um, so practically no contact between these uh, between these groups, uh, of course, particularly pronounced in cases such as um, Australia and Borneo, uh, which became then separated by uh, large bodies of uh, of waters as compared to the periods when you when you could. Uh, Cross these um, uh, these straits, and um, there exists a general law which is easy 
uh, easy to grasp um, that uh, that genetic distance um, increases in correlation with physical distance and with the separation uh, in time. And I uh, provided you with um, two charts um, that are just supposed to give you some rough indication of this. I have no intention to go into that in, um, in great detail. Um, but the first one, this uh, tree, tree diagram, um, uh, indicates roughly uh, the distance uh, in the genetic uh, material of <coughs> the populations living in these um, major areas and reflect in a way the um, breaking the, the periods when uh, population uh, broke away um, from each other, so indicating, for instance, that um, uh, the first split occurred between Africa and uh, Asia, um, and then the second split occurred um, with uh, from uh, a between Asia and uh, and Europe, um, and uh, the third one was Asia and. America and indicating also uh, the wide genetic distance, so to speak, between Africa on the one hand and uh, the oceanic uh, population on the other. Um, the other table is, uh, is more detailed, as you see. It has on the left side uh, the genetic relationships uh, how far or close some of the major uh, ethnic groups are uh, genetically. Um, and uh, on the right side, uh, how close or distant they are in terms, of, uh, in terms of their languages. There's obviously some sort of correlation between language groups and linguistic groups but by no means a perfect one, which can be, of course, explained mostly by, uh, again, by invasions of various people uh, who then uh, spread, spread their own language also in regions that were genetically originally different. Um, or sometimes you have regions that are genetically quite close, uh, but they have broad languages from uh, far away distances. An example would be, for instance, uh, in, in the European uh, scenery, let's say, uh, the, f the, f the Finns uh, and the Hungarians and the Turks, um, which have uh, somewhat closely related um, uh, languages, even though they uh, are uh, physically uh, quite quite far removed from uh, from each other. Um, I'll come back to this uh, type of uh, topic about uh, different ethnicities and um, uh, related subjects in uh, in a later lecture. Um, for the current current purpose, uh, this is entirely. Uh, entirely sufficient just to <coughs> get some sort of uh, feeling how the separation and the movement of uh, hunter-gatherers with very little contact with each other uh, automatically brings these, uh, these results um, about. Um, in addition, this um, separation and very limited uh, cooperation between different groups um, brings also about a tendency to to create a large variety of languages. Uh, you will see later on there exists of course also a tendency uh, 
uh, for languages to be reduced in number at the moment when the contacts between various groups becomes intensified. That is, um, when uh, division of labor is no longer restricted to these small groups, but uh, uh, division of labor becomes uh, more extensive and more intensive, including ever uh, larger regions of the population, then, then there is a countervailing uh, tendencies because then there exists, of course, again, a need for people to communicate, each, com communicate with each other. And one can recognize that it is then an advantage uh, to speak languages that are spoken by very many people if you are living more or less enclosed in small groups and the division of labor is restricted to these small groups, then there is no disadvantage at just having a different language for each one of these um, groups. Uh, currently, there exist about five to 6,000 um, languages. Um, but to give you an extreme example, uh, 1,000 of these five to 6,000 languages um, are spoken, for instance, in, in Guinea. Um, and half of these 1,000 languages have no more than uh, 500 speakers. Um, that is pretty close to the number that I gave you, what the minimum size of a group has to be in order to avoid negative genetic effects, so to speak. And, uh, uh, and there are only a few in Guinea that are spoken by uh, more than 100,000 uh, people. Again, that also immediately indicates something about uh, yeah, the state of development of this place, that obviously that is not a place uh, in which uh, the division of labor is uh, very extensive and intensive. They are still living uh, rather is isolated and have only division of labor within their little uh, within their little tribes without uh, much need to uh, to learn other languages or one language taking over other languages and become um, the dominant one. Um, so division of labor at this stage uh, of a very, very limited kind. Uh, obviously, women tend to be more the gatherers. Men tend to be more the hunters. Um, there are some people who make tools and so forth. Uh, but uh, the number of tools and instruments is also very, uh, very limited. Um, so by and large, uh, very small numbers of different professions, if we can talk about that at all. There are probably no one who is really specializing full time in certain types um, of uh, activities. Um, the division of labor even shrinks uh, at times during, um, during this period, uh, which leads to a situation where people unlearn things that were already part of uh, the accumulated knowledge of, uh, of mankind. Um, those things took place in particular in the cases of uh, uh, New Guinea and uh, Australia and uh, Tasmania, that is places that uh, for tens of thousands of years were completely isolated from, uh, from anybody else and could not even occasionally, so to speak, adopt techniques or knowledge that had been accumulated at other parts of the world. So for instance, um, the Australian Aborigines um, still used uh, stone tools in uh, and around 1800. Um, in, in Tasmania, um, which were cut off for some 10,000 years from uh, any other place, uh, these people must obviously have known at some time 
the technique of constructing boats, uh, but when they were rediscovered, they were not able uh, to make boats. Um, they must at some time have had the capability of using bows and arrows, um, but when they were rediscovered, uh, they were not able to use uh, uh, arrows and, uh, and, uh, and bows because the population had become too small uh, and, uh, and no influx of innovation came in. So these people with a smaller population simply became less informed, less knowledgeable than they must have been uh, at the beginning. Um, the same is also true, by the way, for Eskimos and uh, Polynesians. Um, the Polynesians also had uh, partially unlearned the ability of making boats, even though they must have had this ability at some time in the past, uh, un unless they were very good uh, swimmers. Um, <laughs> they, as a little side, uh, as a little side remark, um, the there exists an explanation why Polynesians tend to be a very fat people. Uh, that is because fat people had, so to speak, uh, uh, an ad advantage to survive at long boat trips where they didn't know where they would end up. Um, so people who had accumulated a lot of body fat or so had a higher chance to f finally find whatever Fiji Islands or whatever these places uh, are, which still, which is, so to speak, an explanation why we still find massive, massive people on, uh, uh, on these places, far more massive than you would find them in um, other regions of, um, of the world. Um, so then we arrive at one of the yeah, great revolutions in, um, in human development, and uh, that is a so-called uh, Neolithic uh, revolution, which took place about uh, 12 to 10,000 years ago. And um, the main explanatory factor for this was uh, that land became gradually scarcer and scarcer uh, and more valuable. Uh, and um, the pressure, so to speak, arose to find a solution to the problem. How do we f feed the people uh, who cannot walk around and break away and find new hunting and uh, gathering uh, places? Uh, we have to make it possible that people uh, can live in larger numbers uh, on uh, on smaller uh, on smaller territories before land was more or less treated as a free good um, and if it is treated as a free good, there existed of course also no yeah no incentive to appropriate it uh, to make land what will establish property in land in the previous lecture I explained. It was, of course, perfectly nat natural that people considered the bow and arrow their bow and arrow and the axe their axe and so forth. Uh, and when they hunted down a buffalo, when I had, if I had hunted him down, then of course it was my buffalo. And uh, uh, but property in land uh, is a relatively new invention, so to speak. And the explanation is land all of a sudden is perceived to be scarce. Uh, and as soon as it becomes to be perceived as scarce, uh, there will be attempts made by people to, yeah, uh, to fence pieces off from, uh, from other pieces, uh, to mark places off from other places and, uh, uh, and claim them as uh, mine, uh, or, uh, 
or yours. Um, the um, uh, the places where agriculture starts are naturally those places that uh, have by nature, so to speak, an abundance of suitable plants. Um, that is where you have wild corn and wild wheat and wild, uh, wild rye and so forth. Uh, people settle then there and then begin to uh, cultivate that uh, breed uh, uh, better products. Um, and um, uh, those happen to be the places that we describe as the Fertile Crescent, that is what is Iraq and, uh, uh, and Syria and those places nowadays uh, on the one hand and on the other hand uh, uh, China, uh, that is places that were uh, uh, located uh, close to uh, 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 rivers. Um, and then uh, later on, of course, also um, Egypt. Um, again, we might want to take a, a look at the, at the next chart that I have here um, that um, deals on the one hand with examples of um, domesticated um, uh, plants and animals uh, by uh, the date of earliest domestication and um, and by uh, and by region. Um, uh, so again, this this begins, so to speak, at uh, about eight eight thousand uh, before before Christ. The only animal that had been domesticated before was the dog, which you find on, on the opposite, um, opposite page. Uh, dogs, of course, had been already of some use for hunters and uh, gatherers. Uh, all the other uh, animals are typical animals that are uh, useful only in, uh, in agricultural uh, societies and not so much use, useful if you lead um, uh, uh, if you lead um, uh, uh, hunter and uh, gatherer life um, existences. Um, again, the thing that I would like to make you aware of here is uh, the remarkable observation. Uh, that there existed basically no large-scale domesticated animals on the American uh, continent, except for the llama, uh, which is not exactly uh, 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 comparable in its uh, versatility to uh, horses and uh, cows and those things. Uh, there exist some explanations that Mr. Diamond proposes which don't sound too plausible to me. Um, he is some sort of environmentalist. Um, he explains, for instance, the fact that uh, there are no domesticated animals, large-scale animals on the American continent with the fact that uh, it points out that initially there existed all the animals on the Amer American continent that existed in Asia and Europe also. Um, but on the American continent, uh, overhunting uh, took place. And then you ask, of course, why did overhunting take place? Why did they wipe out all of these animals? and did not recognize in time, so to speak, the value of some of them, uh, put the potential to be domesticated and so forth, as compared to what people did in 
uh, in Eurasia, uh, and his explanation is uh, that uh, people arrived in uh, America at a later date than in Asia and in Europe, and at that date, uh, the weapons technology was already further, further developed, so the killing potential was greater for those people uh, active on the American continent, uh, such that uh, uh, the extinction of, uh, of animals resulted there and did not result um, in Eurasia. Again, there exist, of course, also uh, other explanations uh, for this, uh, to which I will uh, come uh, at some uh, at some future lecture that might have also something to do, of course, with a lack of foresight. Um, that uh, there was more foresight among some people in Eurasia and less foresight um, in, uh, in uh, America to prevent the sort of, uh, from environmental catastrophe, as we might call it, uh, from, um, uh, uh, from occurring. Um, now, agricultural life um, allows, of course, a far greater density of the population than uh, hunter-gatherer uh, existences. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is estimated that uh, 10 to 100 times as many people can live on the same piece of land if they engage in agriculture than if they would engage in um, hunting and uh, gathering um, activities. And um, we also recognize that as soon as you have uh, settled uh, uh, as, as soon as you settle down, uh, build agricultural communities, for the first time it becomes possible that uh, capital can be accumulated. Uh, imagine hunters and gatherers who just schlep around from place to place. Uh, there is only so many things that you can take with you. you uh, after all, you have to carry all of this. Uh, and uh, most of the stuff becomes excess uh, baggage. Uh, now that you settle, of course, you can establish storages, uh, you can uh, accumulate things for bad seasons, um, and um, uh, you can feed not only larger, larger numbers, uh, you can also turn your activity from one type of uh, farming to other types of farming, from uh, growing one type of, uh, uh, of cereal to growing other types of uh, cereal and so forth. Initially, uh, the way anthropologists describe, or compare the life of the hunters and gatherers with the life of uh, the settlers, the agricultural uh, settled people, uh, they point out that the life of hunters and gatherers was in a way easier, uh, nicer. Um, they spent only a few hours a day just uh, hunting away and then they were lazing around, whereas <laughs> the, the agricultural people worked for long periods of time uh, especially since, the, uh, since this whole thing started, so to speak, in the Middle East with comparatively nice weather all year around, uh, you could work also all year around, whereas uh, hunters and gatherers uh, had entire seasons uh, off. So there are, <laughs> there are so are anthropologists <coughs> report, for instance, that the hunters and gatherers frequently uh, laughed at the stupid uh, agricultural uh, settlers there that they worked so hard and th and they themselves had uh, such a nice and uh, uh, and lazy life. Um, what is not true, however, which you find in some books re reported, that it was that these uh, hunter-gatherer societies 
um, turned out to be militarily, so to speak, superior over agricultural societies and regularly raided them. Um, and if you think about it, while this is of course possible, um, there are compelling reasons why that should not be the case. That is why agricultural societies should have been, even in this department, that is defending themselves superior over um, hunter-gatherer societies simply because they engage in capital accumulation. They are denser populations, they have far more men uh, and in conflicts typically it was not the hunter-gatherer societies that beat the agricultural societies but vice, vice versa. Um, because of this then um, well, let me just say something about uh, the uh, population size again. Uh, so with the uh, Neolithic revolution, so from t 10 to 12,000 years ago, um, the, uh, um, the population uh, doubles every 1,300 years roughly, as compared with 13,000 years uh, prior to that. So that we have, for instance, um, again, these are all uh, ballpark figures. At some later lecture, I will also give you a table with, with some sort of population estimates. Um, so the estimation is uh, that maybe 10,000 years ago, we had 5 million people at the beginning of the Neolithic Revolution. And in, in the year one, uh, the numbers that are given go from 170 million to 400 million. So if you take an average of these uh, estimates, then you come up with this uh, rough idea of uh, 1,300 years per, uh, per doubling of um, of the population. Now this superiority of agricultural societies over hunter-gathering societies is then responsible for the gradual spreading of these societies. Um, this did not start at every place. It started at a few places, as I said, Fertile Crescent, then some places in, in China. And gradually, uh, the farmer, so to speak, take over more and more land. Uh, the hunter-gatherers are first transformed into herders. Um, that is, they don't roam around anymore. They have no deal with tamed animals. But the tamed animals are, of course, now on the, outs on the outskirts. And even the herders gradually lose more and more land to the ever-expanding uh, 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 farming, um, farming population. Again, if you just look at, uh, at the current world, uh, hunters and gatherers practically exist no more at all, except at the very fringes of, of the globe. Uh, and even herders exist only uh, at, uh, at very small places, again, far removed, whatever, in Siberia, in places uh, of that kind. Um, so the superior civilization, if we want to use this term, uh, the agricultural civilization gradually expands um, outward. Um, the time, for instance, um, um, you can gather that from, um, from one of these uh, uh, tables also um, where um, uh, when, when various um, uh, plants and so forth appear in, in various regions, uh, the, the time um, is about f it takes about 5,000 years for agriculture to spread from the Fertile Crescent to reach a place like England. Um, so that would be 
uh, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, that would be an expansion of something like one, uh, slightly more than one kilometer per, per year. Uh, which is added, so to speak, to uh, an agriculturally used uh, territory and taken away from uh, hunter-gatherer uh, um, uh, territories. Um, the division of labor now intensifies, of course, uh, quite a bit. Um, there are not just three, four different types of occupation that you can do. Um, uh, small villages uh, coming into existence, uh, 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 craftsmen uh, uh, who are specialized in these tasks uh, uh, evolve, um, far more specialization. Um, there is also a certain amount of inter-regional trade now developing, whereas between the hunter-gatherer societies, as I said, there was practically no trading uh, going on whatsoever. And of course, uh, it, innovations now spread uh, in some sort of regular and permanent uh, way. Uh, again, hunter-gatherer societies living, so to speak, side by side, um, it happens. But it happens uh, more or less by accident that one group picks up a new technique that has been developed by another one. Um, now, in agricultural societies, people living uh, next door to each other are being integrated to a certain extent through division of labor. Of course, the diffusion of knowledge also takes, uh, takes place. That is something that is developed in one place will eventually arrive at some other place and will be imitated there if it happens to be, um, happens to be useful um, at, uh, at those places. And of course, the direction is, uh, is always from, uh, from the center of civilization, which Fertile Crescent and uh, the uh, river valleys in China to the periphery where the wild people still live. Um, uh, and no longer does it take place that, yeah, that the division of labor breaks down as easily, that something is simply forgotten. Um, be, as long as contact uh, remains in existence, and it does remain in existence, and the population size increases, uh, uh, the specialization progresses, and innovations are transported from, uh, from place to place. Um, and what I pointed out before, now with agriculture, we see also uh, a tendency that this previous tendency of languages to break up into larger and larger numbers of different languages does come to a certain halt. Um, uh, there is now more communication between them. There is a greater advantage to speak languages that are spoken by many people uh, and also a tendency, so to speak, for the first time to learn the languages of uh, of neighboring, uh, uh, neighboring regions uh, because you trade and uh, associate with them to a certain extent, which you did not do uh, during the previous phase of, uh, um, of mankind. Um, let me end this lecture by um, uh, quoting, providing you with two quotes from um, Mises. The first one, a quote, the full implication of which I will only exp will only become clear in the in the next lecture. I I think um, uh, Mises tries to explain 
why there is, so to speak, an inherent tendency in human development of extensive, of extending the division of labor, of um, having more and more people participate in division of labor, and to intensify division of labor, that is to specialize more and more and dedicate your entire time to specific tasks rather than do one hour this and another hour this and an hour uh, this. And the second, the second quote, um, uh, which again leads over to uh, the first lecture of tomorrow morning, um, a quote where he uh, describes, so to speak, the inherent limitations that purely agricultural societies have, uh, which lets us expect, so to speak, that a new invention has, been, has to be made again, just as we invented agriculture to solve the problem of the scarcity, increasing scarcity of land. Um, we have to uh, make, a mankind has to come up with another, uh, has to solve another challenge um, that is inherent in, in purely agricultural societies, that is uh, uh, to develop industrial societies with cities in order to deal with the fact that, of course, even in agricultural societies, we will reach eventually the point again when uh, the land cannot support uh, steadily growing populations and a new institution allowing us to live on far denser, uh, in, on, on uh, far smaller territories comes, uh, comes into being. Uh, the, first, the first quote, as I said, dealing with uh, the cause, what he says, the cause of social evolution. And there he says, the simplest way to depict the evolution of society is to show the distinction between two evolutionary tendencies which are related to each other in the same way as intention and extension. Society develops subjectively and objectively. Subjectively by enlarging its membership. We have seen, we have seen how that takes place, uh, reaching already several million people um, at, uh, at the beginning of the Neolithic Revolution and then shooting up from there in a more rapid rate. Um, so, subjectively by enlarging its membership and objectively by enlarging the aims of its activities. Far more activities become possible in an agricultural society. We build huts, uh, we build tools for which there was no need before. We build storage facilities and so forth. Um, enlarging the aims of human activities. Originally confined to the narrowest circles of people, to immediate neighbors, the division of labor gradually becomes more general until eventually it includes all mankind. This process, still far from complete and never at any point in history completed, is finite. We can, of course, imagine, so to speak, a point when this process has reached an end. When all men on earth form a unitary system of division of labor, it will have reached its goal. Side by side with this extension of the social bonds goes a process of intensification social action embraces more and more aims. And the area in which the individual provides for his own consumption becomes constantly narrower. We need not pause at this stage to ask whether this process will eventually re result in the specialization of all productive activity. But again, 
the tendency is clearly in this, uh, in this direction. And now an interesting quote on uh, yeah, what I might call the limitations of purely agricultural uh, societies. There he says, we may depict conditions of a society of agriculturist, agriculturalist in which every member tills a piece of land large enough to provide himself and his family with the, with the indispensable necessities of life. We may include in such a picture the existence of a few specialists, artisans like smiths and professional men like doctors. We may even go further and assume that some men do not own a farm but work as laborers on other people's farms. The employer remunerates them for their help and takes care of them when sickness or old age disables him. This scheme of an ideal society was at the bottom of many ut utopian plans. It was by and large realized for some time in some communities. The nearest approach to its realization was probably the commonwealth which the J Jesuit padres established in the country which is today Paraguay. There is, however, no need to examine the merits of such a system of social organization. Historical evolution burst it asunder. Its frame was too narrow for the number of people who are living today on the Earth's surface. The inherent weakness of such a society is that the increase in population must result in progressive poverty. If the estate of a deceased farmer is divided among its children, the holdings finally become so small that they can no longer provide sufficient sustenance for a family. Everybody is a landowner, but everybody is extremely poor. Conditions, as they prevailed in large areas of China, provide a sad illustration of the misery of the tillers of small parcels. The alternative to this outcome is the emergence of a huge mass of landless proletarians. Then a wide gap separates the disinherited paupers from the fortunate farmers. They are a class of pariahs whose very existence presents society with an insoluble problem. They search in vain for a livelihood. Society has no use for them. They are destitute. And here then a solution to another problem has to be developed and that is the solution of industrial capitalism. The development of towns, money, uh, which allows another push uh, in, in the growth of mankind and in the specialization uh, of, of tasks. And I will talk about that tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Is this the lecture? where you can discuss private property as the ownership of land and how much land a party should own, perhaps mentioning eminent domain. I, I, I will, I will come back to this subject several, still sev at several points again. Um, yeah, but, but yes, of course. Um, but here you immediately realize that, of course, if we use this idea uh, that you acquire property in things that you have brought under your own control. The initial size of farm plots must have been very moderate. Um, right? you, you, I mean, we have, at this time we have no fast transport means of transportation that would allow us to just plow huge amounts of, of land. Uh, so the parcels uh, that people bring under their active control are comparatively small. Uh, 
Uh, you do ha have, however, in those societies already a certain stratification. That is, uh, there will be wealthier farmers and uh, less wealthy farmers. Uh, there will be some farmers who will be able to buy up the farmland of someone else. Um, so you can already have significant differences in the size of land holdings uh, in, in such societies, but you could not have anything like uh, Mises describes it at some point and during the Roman Empire that whatever uh, three or four people owned uh, all, all of Africa. Um, that you can only have with the help of a state, but not by, uh, by personally or with the help of your employees taking possession, doing something to the land, uh, fertilizing it, uh, cultivating it, and so forth. Any idea I have had is unsuccessful in that, as I see the desirable properties being in contention, jealousies, that it entails a necessity for individual self-defense and the aligning themselves with the community, wherein jointly they can, and to proceed it on, I end up with a war despite our, <laughs> one of our chief objectives being to keep things peaceable. No, first of all, yes, it is true that these agricultural societies, as I pointed out, have better defense capabilities bec because they are closer together. Um, they are adjoined. Uh, and they can accumulate capital in this in this regard they have an advantage over these roaming uh, hunters and um, and gatherers and the second point yes of course there is competition for the best land um, but uh, we have to keep in mind there also that what is the best land and the best location is something that does change um, I recall the Sahara at one point in time was uh, a piece of land that could be agriculturally used and then became entirely useless. Um, yeah, regions that could not be used at all can be used as soon as we have air conditioning. Um, that is, technological advances, um, changes in, in, uh, in, 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 in the climate, uh, can make certain things attractive uh, that were formerly unattractive and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and we can even go a step further, we can say, yes, there is of course also a certain amount of entrepreneurial talent involved in picking out right, uh, right places. Um, that is, uh, at, at least nowadays in the uh, uh, thousands of years it was of course uh, far more difficult because we had no idea of what what the world offered so to speak but now that we know basically everything how it looks there and how it looks here now of course it is all partly entrepreneurial talent to figure out hey this is this is a prom this is a promising piece of land and I should get this one uh, and we can even say go as far as to say then, then, s then smarter people will tend to uh, settle at better places, and and dumber ple dumber people will end up at at uh, less attractive places. To put it bluntly, so to speak. The loser in the competition is encouraged to move from Africa to Australia, isn't he? <laughs> yes, just like you see, like just like the hunter gatherers were driven out. They had to just, th at the end, there was, was just the uh, Antarctica and the North Pole left over for them. Uh, at the beginning, they could roam all, uh, all over. I mean, that place where we have now uh, Cannes and uh, Monaco and beautiful places and uh, San Diego and who knows what. <laughs> uh, it was available to everyone. But we cannot imagine that hunter-gatherers uh, would be able to hold on to places like this under current conditions, obviously. Yeah. I'm just curious about the idea that hunter-gatherers uh, 
basically went into an agricultural region and took over and you know, set up the, the state or you know a, a ruling uh, group. Where did that idea originate? I I find that, for instance, in um, uh, in Röp Röpki and, and not Röpki, uh, Alexander Rusto. Um, and I think also in I think also Oppenheimer has sometimes this um, uh, this statement. Um, their view is, yeah, they are better in the short run. Of course, they are better in the handling of arms. That's what they have done. They have arrows and bows and this sort of stuff. Does but I think I mean there is yeah, <laughs> empirical evidence in. In this in this entire period is very sparse. Okay. So, um, so I mm, I have heard I have heard both po both positions argued. Um, I have persuaded myself to adopt the one that I presented here based more on theoretical reasons. Uh, after all, they will be wealthier. After all, they can engage in capital accumulation. After all, they will, after a short period of time, of course, have people who are better as specialist warriors than the hunters and gatherers are. Um, with, without saying that that other thing cannot happen. Obviously, if you do a surprise attack and, uh, and loot some farming community, that can happen. Um, but if you think, w w but would that be, so to speak, over and over possible? Is that the dominant pattern? And there I would say it, all theoretical reasons speak against that. Especially doesn't Oppenheimer, he doesn't, I thought it was not so much hunter-gatherers he was talking about as uh, herders. Yeah, yeah but, I think, but, the, but the same reasoning does apply to the herders as well. But they're agriculturists. I mean, they no, they are not. You see, like, th that is, th that is, it is an intermediate stage. They are not agriculturalists in the same in the same sense. They are not completely settled. I mean, they. But they do not. Again, they do not have a possibility to accumulate capital to the same extent as settled communities have. The stock is capital. What? Yeah, but the, the the life the livestock is is not is not capital that is relevant when it comes to defending yourself. Um, it's like you do you, you cannot build fortifications and things like this. Um, yes, you, yeah, you, you can <laughs> right in some movies you can just run your buffaloes there through. Uh, <laughs> But again, you see, like if you have villages, you can build walls. Um, the herders would not have walls. They just uh, so in this in this sense, I think the same type of reasoning, not to the same extent as hunter gatherers, applies to them as well. So I consider that to be also the less likely scenario, even even though that is more likely that they did it than hunter gatherers. Well, it, I mean. The fact is probably that those two types of agriculture just didn't exist um, separately, like just cultivation and just herding. That they probably overlap. And, you know, like some cultures may have been more herding and some may have been more tilling. No, it was by and large again the the, the herding population gets gets also pushed more and more to the fringes. You you had that in the United States also. You had the the fights between the farmers. And, and the herders. And of course, the herders must lose this fight. I mean, there's no question about it. So I think what we saw in the United States, the American continent being, so to speak, one of the least developed of, of the continents, um, things taking place here with the delay of a few thousand years as compared to uh, what we more advanced Europeans uh, had. Cattlemen ate beans, though, on their cattle crops. So, I mean, they did rely on tillage just as much as the farmers did. Right. So, I mean, they had something people who They weren't lost livestock. They bought the beans. The herds were just for survival. 
I mean, their own. I mean, they didn't raise up extra stock to go trade. No, and again, the her the herders have the problem that the, the uh, they have no n no clear cut uh, ownership in land concept yet. Right. It develops in them. You can see it. They are closer to it than the hunters and gatherers. Um, but it is precisely that you have f fights among uh, different herders because uh, your sheep uh, graze on the, uh, what, what other people consider to be their territory and so forth and it is not completely delineated as it would be in settled agriculture. That happened in Kazakhstan. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, in the book Guns, Germs and Steel that Diamond had theorized that at one time the various animals that were available in Europe and so forth were available in America. Yeah, they must have bone, uh, uh, bones or so that they claimed this. That they had, the existing populations had exterminated them. Yes, that's so what he claims. The logic I keep thinking of is while they were exterminating the last few pigs and cows and whatever, did they fail to notice the tens of millions of buffalo running by them or? No, the buffaloes didn't exist. The buffaloes were also, they also were, uh, came back afterwards, I guess. Oh. They didn't exist. These are all European uh, <laughs> imports, the horses and all of that that came. There was no... Well, this supposedly happened before I mean, the buffalo, I, I assume the, buff the buffaloes can be domesticated, right? Yeah, but we have, buff we have water buffaloes and that sort of stuff, right? <laughs> what? Different species? Bison. The American bison is bison, not uh, technically buffalo. So, and they're harder to investigate. And, and that, that was Diamond's thesis, that the thesis that a lot of the American animals were just temperamental. Like, animals that were just temperamental. I'm not sure I buy that either, but um, they were just temperamental. They were temperamental. And I'm not sure I buy that either, but even now when people keep bison in enclosures, they have to use different kinds of fencing. You know, they're, they're just not. They're just big. Now, whether or not they are domesticable is. But in any case, but but he does he does claim that all the species that existed on the Eurasian continent existed at some point in the United States also in, in on the American continent, uh, and and were hunted down to extinction. That he that he does claim. Um, he another another explanation that doesn't work in his case is he. Uh, he, he points out, for instance, uh, what, well you see that on that table too, that there are v very few domesticated plants in Africa and also very few domesticated animals in Africa. Uh, and he has a list of domesticatable plants and domesticatable animals and then shows that it doesn't happen in Africa uh, but his general explanation is always to say there are some regions there are less domesticatable plants and animals and because of that they lack development but in the African case it would not work at all because they have just as many as they had on other continents and the development is basically zero. Because they all left there and went to uh, it, it, but in any case it, 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 it does not support it does not support at all his environmentalist explanation. Uh, there are obviously easy explanations to come up with that would be able to explain this, but he doesn't uh, touch those explanations. Um, just as I, sh I should point out uh, also this book by uh, Cavalli Sforza, he of course also rejects any type of, yeah, how can I say, ethnic IQ explanations or something like this in his preface, in, his po in the postscript to the book. Uh, there he says almost, there is no difference between all, they're all the same and blah, blah, blah. But the entire book is a book that explains how different they actually are. Um, so I think that, that Cavalli Sforza wrote the preface and the, the postscript and after he was hired at Stanford and then he realized at Stanford certain things you could not say. <laughs> so in order to pacify his colleagues, he wrote this politically correct preface and postscript uh, hoping that, nobody like most academics, it. nobody would read the middle <laughs> and, and uh, they would be all happy this way. Well. Um, I, did, I didn't read the Diamond book word for word, but um, it seemed to me that his thesis was that the Eurasian continent was the only continent that had a population of 
the more that there was a different density of domesticable species in, uh, in the Fertile Crescent than there were in other places. So that in the entirety of Africa, there may have been 15 domesticable species. And in the small Fertile Crescent area, there were 15 domesticable species. And so that, um, but that the idea of domestication couldn't easily develop unless you had a certain concentration of several domesticable species. No, I, I don't remember this. I, I remember the tables where he has d d right. simply listed and. Continent, and one was looking at a small area, and, and I thought that that was his major point that you had all these species concentrated into a small area, whereas in other areas you had a similar number of species, but over a much. No, he has also he has broad categories also for the other. He says simply Eurasia, which is obviously also a very broad category. Right, but I, you know, more in the text of the table, it seems like he was talking a lot. What I understood was that there, he felt like there was a different density of domesticated species in that one area, and that's what gave it the advantage. You know, we we don't have to we don't have to decide this uh, question now. I also would not feel competent enough to decide questions such as this. I just want to make you aware of the fact that Mr. Diamond has a clear-cut agenda in his book, and an agenda that is contradicted at many places in his own book, which he does not seem to be aware of. Um, that doesn't make the book any uh, any less enjoyable. I thought that is a, a very interesting book. Just. As I think that uh, Cavalli's Forza book is a very enjoyable book. I don't agree with everything that he says. In those areas where I feel competent to make judgment myself, I think they make, uh, they make clear mistakes. In other areas, I feel completely incompetent when it comes to genetic differences and that sort of stuff. That's, that's their specialty. Uh, and what I do here is just use these things as some sort of illustration. I, my purpose is an entirely different purpose as that from Cavalli Sforza or uh, Jared Diamond. I, um, in, a, in many ways, I have far more ambitious goals than these people do. <laughs> no, yeah, of course, you will see that. <laughs> OK, I think let's let that be enough for today.